Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sandy. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Just let me know through the chat box. Very good. Thank you for the emphatic guesses. I really appreciate that. Excellent. Uh, well, I want to, before I say anything further, I want to uh, um, ask everybody to give a round of applause and cheers for uh, our wonderful organizers. Uh, Steve Hargadon and Sandy Hirsch have done terrific work in bringing all this together, making it all work. It's, they have assembled a tremendous number of people, and I just want to give them a lot of thanks. Thanks as well to the sponsors and the founding partners who helped make it possible. I think we're all in debt to their efforts. Now, I'd like to begin by uh, just quickly reflecting on what I've heard today uh, from the uh, uh, other panelists this morning. Um, and uh, and also from the, uh, uh, from the sessions that I've been to since. Uh, so I'll just begin by saying it's, it's fascinating to see some of the ideas. Um, Okay. Brian, that just means okay. somebody tried to turn on the teleconference bridge so they could call in by phone and it's done and shouldn't come up again. Very good. So to begin with, I was very impressed by the idea that there is a civic role for distance, uh, for digital literacy learners and for teachers, that we are not teaching in isolation or learning in isolation, but in a social situation. There's also the emphasis on the emergence of new technologies and practices, um, and that appeared everywhere from Doug Belshaw's initial uh, slide showing a whole series of new ones, to a University of Michigan presentation, which asked us to think about adding other information forms to our consideration beyond the textual document. They were urging us to think about images, data, infographics. Above all, I'll the idea that it was important to teach critical thinking and how much more challenging that was than we thought. Uh, we saw some of that, for example, from uh, Lisa, uh, who was pointing out the importance of teaching curiosity and instilling that in people. We also have the fact that when we look at fake news, there are multiple forms for it, and not only multiple forms, multiple ways that we assess and respond to it. And one other idea that kept bobbing up like a cork in the sea was the idea of curation, that libraries curate, and we all know this, but also they should teach users to curate content as well. That was a very, very, I mean, just, that's a fascinating kaleidoscope of views about where digital information, digital literacy is going. Now, I'd like to go a little further than that, and I'd like to get a little meta. Uh, I think, for example, the way uh, Minara this morning was taught, or this afternoon was talking about the way that she was thinking about the major structural changes that have occurred in information, uh, the, the scope of, of ownership and the impact of new forms of creation. And I'd like to ask us to think about where digital literacy is heading. I mean, we can understand some widely understood principles. There's a shared genealogy of media literacy leading information literacy, which goes into digital literacy that I mentioned before. There's a shared understanding that digital literacy involves a mixture of technical, personal, and social capacities. And now there's a rising awareness that digital literacy means learners are social participatory makers. This last point is really just vital and not fully understood, not fully grasped. Learners use digital tools to both consume information and make and share new stuff, which isn't the universal way we think of how schools, libraries, and museums operate. Students are now prosumers in Alvin Toffler's formulation. They are also increasingly digital storytellers, which reframes their relationship to content. Well, if all this is true, where do we go from here? When we think of digital literacy in 2017, we can't help but think of what happened in 2016. Last year's events have made us all conscious of the deep connection between digital literacy and politics. Yes, some observers have been making this argument for years. I was thinking of leaders like, well, our Doug Belshaw, but also Helen Beetham and even Ellen Helsper, among others. But the watershed of American and British votes with their international implications have forced everyone to rethink the political grounding of information, media, and the digital world. Hence our focus on fake news. This is a powerful realization, and we're just in the first stages of grappling with it. For some, it's a form of grieving for a lost model literacy, and they're working through the first stages of that process, you know, denial and anger. Bargaining, depression, and acceptance are coming right up. But grapple we must, and the new dynamics are complex. 
we have to think of the global crisis of sustainability. Ecologically, climate change is well underway, and our politics have largely failed to address this most enormous fact, as we've seen about two hours ago when President Trump announced he's pulling the U.S. out of the Paris Agreement. It's naive to think that keeping digital literacy separate from this can work, given what this means for civilization. We have to consider digital literacy in terms of the global crisis in governance. We live in an age of unrest, from the Arab Spring to Ukraine to Black Lives Matter to Brazilian unrest. In many nations, popular discontent with or cynicism toward their political class is rising, fed by revelations like the Panama Papers and unresolved crises like the 2008 financial collapse. People increasingly use social media to inform each other and to organize in the face of documented corruption and economic malaise. Meanwhile, that political class grows anxious about governability, skeptical of democracy, and turns increasingly to surveillance, state influence, and open control of media, the use of nudging to reshape citizen behavior, and even in the case of China, gamified authoritarianism. We cannot consider digital literacy without this context. What does this mean for digital literacy? Where is this going? As a futurist, that's the question I ask of every trend and problem. Let me offer some trends, cautions, and hope. We should probably expect further political dysfunction, especially as different developments exacerbate each other. Environmental stresses can trigger social upheaval. State crackdowns can elicit dissent or insurgency. Mutual distrust can worsen relations between governors and the governed. Governments and business use digital technology to attempt to influence and control the populations, while those same populations use much of that technology to inform themselves, organize, and resist. Meanwhile, Technological and demographic forces continue to rewrite many aspects of human society. As the great science fiction writer and futurist Bruce Sterling sums up, the middle of the 20th century, from about here up to about 2070, 2075, it's old people in big cities afraid of the sky. So how does digital literacy evolve in this context? Well, people will use digital literacy by any definition, to organize politically across the full range of political spectra, from Antifa to alt-right, black bloc to pro-government rallies and militias. Those of us who teach or support digital literacy cannot separate ourselves from these uses any longer. We have to think and rethink our practice accordingly. We also have to be mindful of the full range of technology and its complexity. On the one hand, we obviously need to advance our frameworks and curricula as new platforms emerge and grow. Virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, blockchain-based systems like Ethereum, and the Internet of Things each offer distinct affordances, virtues, and challenges for information and creativity. Those of us in the digital literacy field have to be ahead of the curve in understanding the implications. Automation is another technological field that we need to observe closely and work critically with. Here's just one tweet that I keep coming back to. This is from the fellow who's in charge of the company that owns Google. In the long run, I think we will evolve in computing from a mobile-first to an AI-first world. Think about that. Think about how far education is from being mobile-first right now. Technology automation has already impacted information, media, and digital literacies. We have spam bots. We have AI-generated journalism. We have software conducting legal document discovery. We can go further. Think about meta. If you don't know this, this is software designed to automate some aspects of scientific publication and discovery, including identifying promising research before it wins professional attention. Think about that. And it was recently purchased by the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation in their quest to revamp the life sciences. Should we anticipate similar AI projects for information literacy, bots for detecting fake news, software to help us decide how to participate in social media, algorithms for helping us remix or make new content? At the same time, while much of the fake news debate focused on social media, and that came several times in the course of our presentations today, it often ignores the influence of other media, such as television news, which is enormously popular for older people. As media literacy teaches us, we cannot neglect the importance of print and broadcast media, which persist even as the attention spotlight moves on. As David Egerton reminds us, 
older technologies often have a long lifespan and actual use. But we must attend to mixed reality and drone-enabled Wi-Fi. We cannot forget that people still use radio, print books, and television. Put another way, older 20th century media habits foregrounding users as consumers rather than producers still persist in the 21st century second decade. That brings us to the question of authority. Concern over fake news has led to two opposed responses. I have previously named them lowercase d Democrats and lowercase n neo gatekeepers. The Democrats argue that people should and can make their own decisions about digital information. They draw on the heritage of information and media literacy, movements which sought to empower users. Now, critics of this democratic approach flood, point to the flood of fake news, some arguing that it helped shape Brexit and Trump. Either users can't be trusted to know and use digital literacies, or enough of us are illiterate enough to turn the bad stories viral. Until the population as a whole practices solidly skeptical digital literacy, Macedonian click farms will prey in our understanding. Hence the need for new authorities such as having Facebook or Google use humans or AI to vet content. Hence, too, the call for more support for traditional authorities, like newspapers or librarians. And this is where I'd, I'd like to close. Librarians think broadly, incorporating political and technological transformation into their very detailed, practical work of if I may respectfully repurpose Reagan Athon, helping connect each prosumer with their information. Librarians may become our guides to digital making. Librarians could become our human guides to automated learning and culture. Librarians, as professionals who have always been committed to their communities, may now become the support networks for political insurgencies, either as restored authorities or as advocates for democratic information in a seething digital world. Librarians are now on the front lines of the future, and they are our best hope for understanding and dealing with these enormous changes. And that's where I'd like to stop. I want to make sure we had time for questions and comments. And I can also work my way through the, oh, my God, the torrent in the chat room. Holy cow. You can put a note in the chat for Brian. If somebody would actually want to take the microphone, you're welcome to raise your hand. There are some of you whose hands are raised. Marlies and Brenda, I'm not sure you did that on purpose. But if you would like us to give you the microphone, feel free to let us know. Maybe just put a note in the chat. Brian, do you see Jeannie's question there? Uh, I don't. What kind of cool programs do you oh, envision? Oh, for the chat box. Oh, yeah. Um, well, think about this. Um, I mean, Meta is a fascinating, fascinating program. Um, I mean, the idea here is that it can basically use machine learning to analyze ideas as they percolate up through scientific literature, through journal articles primarily, right? So we, and we already have programs that can do the same kind of thing for law so that we can do software searches through uh, legal documents over time. Imagine being able to do this, say, in the humanities or in the social sciences or through news. Uh, can we use all of this to, in some ways, create software that can make it easier for us to read more effectively? Will we have a digital literacy bot? Uh, Peggy George just put in my... Uh, uh, my blog, and I'll, I'll blog this um, this text if you like, so you can always have that. Yes, uh, and Lisa points out that uh, law there, there's more software that I haven't mentioned before. Um, you can write a basic law brief. Uh, the Los Angeles Times runs software called QuakeBot that writes journalistic accounts of earthquakes. Uh, there are also several other programs that write journalistic accounts of finance and sports. I mean, already at play. Um, I mean, what I'm waiting for is for people to have co-authors uh, as software for the next published uh, scholarly article. Brian, did you see this question? In regards to the relationship between librarians and automation and learning culture, are you optimistic? Is that the one? Yeah, from LW Tech. 
Whoever you are, LW Tech, thank you. This is a good question. I'll just read this out loud for everyone to get. In regards to the relationship between librarians and automation and learning and culture, are you optimistic about our ability to keep up and maintain control over automation as the guide, or is your outlook more pessimistic? Um, I hate to say, but my answer is yes. Um, you know, in terms of policy, policy usually lags technology. Uh, and that happens everywhere from corporate policy to public policy. And we're seeing this now. Another way that we have uh, automation taking over is in the high-speed trading. So if you look at financial firms, you will have software in two different trading houses <clears throat> engaging in trades back and forth. And they're happening so quickly that humans cannot keep up with their trading. So this is really a post-human financial world. And you have to imagine the trading houses have a hard time keeping up with this. Imagine the SEC or Congress trying to keep up with it. Um, so I, I think in many ways we're, we're going to be catching up. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think that uh, people who work in information and cultural heritage professions, uh, teachers, administrators, museum uh, workers, librarians, uh, I think we have a keen eye on this material now. We're more engaged than ever. We'd like to keep an eye on it. So I think we can have some measure of how to grapple with technology as it goes. Um, but technology is an enormous world. And it happens very, very quickly. So maybe I'm leaning a bit towards pessimistic. Great question. Uh, if I can work my way back up, um, there is, uh, well, there's the observation from Linda R. I think librarians are the software people are looking for, but they don't want to change their stereotypes of us as book holders. Uh, Linda, this is a huge problem, uh, and we've seen this in uh, several different sessions today. Uh, in fact, there is, uh, I think the, during the first slot, there was uh, a discussion where one school librarian said, we would love to do digital literacy, but we're not allowed to. People won't take us seriously, and districts won't support us in that. So I think in many ways, this is, this is challenging. Now, uh, one of the research librarians in China, um, its head librarian, told me that he sees librarians of the future as what he said is information entrepreneurs. So not behind a reference desk, right, but going out into the community, I mean, beyond the library building, trying to put themselves in the way of people who need to have information, especially startups and businesses. So it may be that that kind of aggressive information entrepreneurship is what convinces people that librarians really are the software they need. Uh, Esther Moon, absolutely. Uh, teachers, uh, yes, yes. Uh, so people ask about the libraries. The uh, one we're looking at here is, uh, this is the ground floor of the Helsinki University Library looking up. Uh, it's about seven stories, and it's an extraordinary building. Uh, I strongly recommend visiting it. Uh, this previous one is the National Library of Finland, about half a mile away from the other one. It's an 18th century library, and you can tell it's been beautifully, beautifully restored. Uh, those are extraordinary buildings. So what are the questions do you, do you folks have? Uh, Aaron, uh, my Reagan-Athon quote, if you'll forgive me, um, please. Um, I, I said, uh, the idea is that librarians will be helping connect each prosumer with their information. So that's a, a revision of the for every person in their book. Brian, you, you may be stuck. If you'll notice, sometimes the chat leaves you behind. So there have been some questions that have come in down at the bottom. You may have to scroll down. Oh, fantastic. That. It just refreshed. It just refreshed. Uh, Antonio Menzel wants to know, if you could pick one starting point for high school students, what would it be? Um, I would say start um, either start with computer gaming and ask them to rethink the games as information environments, because gaming is so popular, so rich, and definitely a complex information environment. And then what, you know, see if they can trace outside of the confines of the game. So ask them to think about you know, YouTube videos of the game, people writing about the game, that kind of thing. That's a way to trace out all of their sense. Now, the other is to go to Wikipedia, go to an entry, and look at the talk tab, the discussion tab. And that really is fantastic. It's a free, peel behind the scenes look at all the stuff that goes into making one of those entries. I think that's pretty fascinating. But the other thing is, depending on your, on your population, you might want to ask them to look at local political news, I mean, hyper-local, like their town. And if it's their city, you know, their neighborhood, to, see, you know, to look for information about that so they can look through it. Now, oh, that's a good question. And if I scroll up a little bit, there's a longer question from Catherine Lockmiller. 
So many of the issues we've discussed are structural hegemonic, and while we need to understand them, how do we convince people that we ourselves can be authorities who dismantle and problematize existing power structures? I mean, how do we come up with actual practical methods instead of just talking about it? Catherine, I am not a librarian. Uh, I'm a lifelong librarian fanboy. Uh, as you can see behind me, I'm right now in the uh, Addison County Millsby Public Library. Um, I've studied libraries, I've worked with libraries, I've taught information literacy. Um, so I, I say that to, to say that I, I'm in some ways not a good person to speak to about this. I mean, that's not my profession. That said, um, I think in many ways it's a, it's a kind of classic political problem which depends on your population. If you're talking about academic libraries, for example, uh, and academic librarians, and by academic, I want to include K-12 librarians as well, then you have to wonder how they fit into that school structure. So if you're in a public high school, or if you're at a private liberal arts college, what is the political stance that you're already in? How can you act? For, if you're at a private Catholic school, for example, can you act within the Catholic Church's social justice mission? If you're at a public high school, what are your limitations and what are the directions that you can work through? Can you work through the state government, for example? Beyond that, I would ask, what are your connections to national politics? Can you be involved in a large political party? Um, and then think hard about the divides within those parties. In this past year, we saw a near civil war erupt between both Republican uh, politicians and also between Democratic politicians. I think before going into that, before going into the nitty-gritty of politics, I think we also have to rethink our stance about what does it mean to teach what we teach and to support what we support. When a, when a person comes into a library and wants to study a subject, is that responsibility to help them pop out of their filtered bubble? Or are we supposed to let them sink into that bubble? It's an interesting question, not an easy one to answer. I think in many ways we need to return to the principle of critical librarianship, and if we want to go further, insurgent librarianship, where we actually take aim at these structural hegemonic forces. And we move on, as TSA is no doubt tracking me for insurgency right now. Uh, Zach Lukjan asks, as news media develops more online operations, are there efforts to make more video and audio clips available on open channels like YouTube? That's a great question. Um, and sometimes they are, sometimes they don't. Uh, they don't when they want to push things out through, say, specific apps, uh, mobile apps uh, that aren't on the web, or when they want to make things available behind paywalls. So the Washington Post, for example, sidebar, the Washington Post has this new tag, right, democracy dies in darkness. And whenever I see that, I, I always hear it being spoken in a kind of heavy metal voice. You know, the Washington Post, democracy dies in darkness. But if if, if you... They want everything to be behind that paywall, just like the New York Times mostly does, just like the Wall Street Journal almost completely does, just like the Chronicle Higher Education does. So they've got that. Meanwhile, other people are pushing these out. And then there are the weird, neither open nor silo areas like Facebook, which is a silo. It's not spidered by Google, but it's easy to get into and see. Um, so it's really we're, we're seeing the open closed spectrum being played out more and more. Uh, there was a phrase, I think it was Joe P. Uh, Linda R. suggests being information brokers. I, I think that's a great term. Uh, the trick is to convince people that they actually need an information broker. Uh, Karen asks, how can libraries combat fake news with the assumption of net neutrality? Well, one thing would be to fight for net neutrality and see if we can retain it. Um, we might not. Uh, the current FCC is opposed to it. and. Uh, they're opposed to it in some pretty bad ways. Uh, there's been some hanky-panky over the past two weeks with uh, people uh, suggesting there's been a lot of astroturfing uh, on responses to the FCC's call for feedback on net neutrality. So we have to fight for net neutrality. And if we're going to fight for fake news, we have to think about how people come to libraries uh, for news. What are their demands? And how can we best um, meet those needs? That's a good question, Gary. And Deb Shi uh, observes that uh, Google is not God. A seemingly simple level, we have to help people understand that. People truly believe that hits which come up in one try, search string is all the best and all there is. It, it is true, Deb Shi. It is quite true. But keep in mind as well that people also search socially. That is, we, you think offline. 
if you want to go see a movie and you're wondering what movie you see, you often ask coworkers or family or friends. But we do a lot of that social searching online. So people search through Facebook, for example. If you use Google Plus, and 20 of us do, if you Google search, you'll bring back hits from friends on, on Google Plus. Um, people search through LinkedIn. So we also have that, which isn't necessarily better or worse. Um, I guess that's another God that we should convince people not to believe in. Uh, so yes, we have to convince people of the complexity of information. Uh, Robin Hartman says he or she has been a believer in creating systems that allow users to find what they need without help from the librarian. Am I doing myself a disservice? It's oh, a great question. Um, well, if it's been, from a personal level, if it's been positive for you professionally, I mean, I'm not an advice person. I, I, I'm not an advice columnist. I, I can't really advise you about that. Are you doing other people in the service? Well, in some ways, you know, librarians shouldn't be there for every single encounter. Right? I mean, librarians teach us to, they don't just give us fish, they teach us how to fish. So in many ways, you are, in a sense, complimenting or helping librarians out. Uh, Karen asks, this year fake news carries a supposed political leaning. How to get around it? Karen, could you explain what you mean about that? Are you saying that fake news tends to be right-wing, for example? I'm glad to hear, Simon, that you're teaching in a class on fake news. Good for you. And Lisa Price observes, one of the issues we deal with is med students, grad students, and faculty who think they already know how to search. It's a case of not knowing what they don't know. Again, like Rumsfeld, right, the unknown unknowns. Our difficulty is in finding ways to get across the idea that we can really help them without seeming to insult them. Ah, oh, Lisa, that's hard. It's like the next version of the reference conversation, right, where you have to really be supportive, polite, you know, elicit their thoughts and work with them for what they need. That is challenging. That is challenging. As Elizabeth St. C., I think, says, getting to think outside the box and think critically is so hard. Uh, Jenny, you're absolutely right about uh, about age. Um, it can be very, very challenging. It's one of the reasons I absolutely love public librarians uh, for public libraries because they get to support everybody. The 12-year-old who comes in wanting to 3D print, the 60-year-old who's still trying to figure out what the browser is. I mean, nobody else on earth really has that full range of people that they have to support. Um, again, I, my hats are off. I really, really admire public libraries. Uh, friends, uh, it looks like we are at the last minute of our session. Uh, are there any other questions, anything else you want to talk about that you want me to address, anything you want me to come back to? Um, or do we need a minute to do some housekeeping, Sandy and Steve? Hi, yes, this is Sandy um, Hirsch. Um, I just want to thank you, Brian, for an excellent uh, keynote wrap-up. I thought you did a fabulous job um, bringing together the um, the important topics that we discussed today, and I'm really, we're really, Steve and I are really grateful to you for helping us organize this great event and um, and conference. I also just wanted to um, give a shout out to our excellent volunteers coordinator, uh, Debbie Ferris. She did a great job as she always does in making sure everything runs smoothly in the back end, um, along with Steve. But she's actually our um, the person who's coordinating all the volunteers for all the sessions. So. Let's thank Debbie for all of her great help. Um, and, <laughs> and again, um, and thank you all for participating. I thought this was a great session um, all um, this afternoon or today, whatever time it is with you. We had a lot of great discussion, and I think that's what we were really trying to stimulate um, uh, as we're grappling with this important topic. So I'll turn it over to you, Steve, if you wanted to have any last word. No, I, I well, I will do the last word just because I'll do the housekeeping. But thank you, Brian. Thanks to everybody who's participated. Thanks, Sandy, so much for all that you do for this event. Um, there are many hours of really interesting content yet to watch if you're willing to watch the recordings. And I think I'm going to have to take a couple of days off to do so. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everybody. Take care and bye. Bye bye.